ready for the clockwise view and keep it at Alpha 7. That is so cool. If you look up on a clear night, you might just see one. We know they're up there, cruising around our planet, listening, watching, gathering information. These man-made systems, these satellites, make our lives better. We use satellites um, basically all over the place now. Um, the GPS system is based on satellites, so the, your ability to figure out where you are on a map on your cell phone, that's based on satellites. They're used um, in, in most of our communications in one form or another. Um, so many of your telephone calls get routed through a satellite. Um, almost all of your television at some point passes through a satellite. We use them to predict the weather, to, to figure out where hurricanes are, to figure out whether it's going to be hot or cold tomorrow. And we use them for science as well. Satellites are also critical to the defense and security of our country. Satellites are very important for military forces, most especially the Navy and the Marine Corps, because we operate in such remote parts of the Earth that satellites, in orbit around the Earth, provide the best vantage point to provide us global communications, as well as sensors on orbit to monitor shipping, and also to monitor weather and oceanographic conditions, and also to provide global positioning system navigation and precise timing. But satellites have their limitations. If they break down in orbit, they can't be fixed. We build them, we launch them, we can never get close to them. So satellite servicing would help the defense capability because right now satellites are the only component that I can think of that the, the, the U.S. fields that is never serviced, never touched, never even close inspected. I see the box rising, indicator moving, 10 turns, increasing a little bit, four turns. But why is that? Why can astronauts go on spacewalks to fix the Hubble Space Telescope, but not other satellites? Well, Hubble is only about 350 miles above the surface of the Earth, and geosynchronous satellites are much higher, over 20,000 miles higher, where the protective magnetic field is non-existent. Every time it goes from light to dark, it's very extreme temperature variations because you're outside of the atmosphere and you're in this vacuum of space. Uh, extra radiation as well because of no protection from the atmosphere and also there's always the danger of some type of micrometeoroid or space debris that could actually hit the spacecraft. Yeah, you like it down? Yeah. And so it's a harsh environment. If we send astronauts up with today's spacesuit technology, they would use their career limit in radiation exposure in one hour of doing a spacewalk. We're not ready to send humans there now. Uh, we, we may be at some point, uh, but robotic te technology is ready to go there today. Here at the Space Robotics Lab at NRL, scientists are developing and testing robots that can fix broken satellites. So I can see a number of types of servicing. The simplest would just be a tow truck service. Come up and dock with a satellite, help it get to where it needs to be. The next type of service I would envision would be helping with stuck deployables. Satellites are launched folded up inside a rocket. Um, sometimes the solar panels or the antennas or some other component fails to deploy. A robotic system could easily help that deploy. The next service I would see is we could easily, right now with today's technology, do external upgrades. We might be able to add a new thruster package or a new communications package or something that attaches to the outside of the satellite. Rocket surgery will come later. But how do you get a rigid robot to do the subtle work of human hands? We're focused on computer-controlled docking because there's a time delay from ground to space. Going to geosynchronous Earth orbit, it can be as much as three seconds once you factor in uh, time of flight through space and all the real-world concerns. So imagine if you were driving on the Beltway and your car moved three seconds after you turned the steering wheel. You'd come up with a new way of operating. Well, that's what we, we want to do in space, but we want to have the computers able to do what computers do best and come in and do the, the close approach docking when we have two satellites flying up near each other in a, a relatively risky environment. Get to the point that the computers can bring the docking in autonomously and then bring in computer-assisted and human-controlled servicing so we can really get the, 
get into the detailed work. Let the computers do what they do best, let the humans do what they do best. The robot is this arm, which was developed for NRL here on Earth, where there's gravity. The arm, though, needs to function out in space, where there's no gravity. So how do we test it here? The answer? This table. What is this? We call it the air bearing table. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is that each of the mass targets has these green pucks. Those are called air bearings. They okay. have micropores on the bottom. We feed pressurized air to them. And when we do, the entire thing floats on a very, very small cushion of air, like an upside down air hockey table. And so right now, this way is like what, 200 pounds? 180 pounds. 180 pounds. At the moment. And if I try and move it, it's not going anywhere. Right. Right. But if you were to turn on the air. So if I turn on the air, and we'll give it a second. So now it's floating on air. You'll notice that it hasn't moved because the, the table has been ground to be flat within um, two one thousandths of an inch over its entire surface. But if we push on it. How much force did you apply there? Not very much. Not very much at all. I used one finger. So this is what, it, why do you have a giant air hockey table in here? This is how we simulate what happens when you use a robot arm to reach out and touch a satellite that's floating in space. The air bearing table basically removes friction from the equation. The difficult part of being able to just reach out and grab a satellite that's floating in space is that even though they're very large, if we push on them the wrong way, they'll float away from us, they'll start to tumble, and they have really wide solar panels, 50 meters long in some cases. If they start to tumble, the, the solar panel can rotate around and hit us in the back. That's a bad day. So what you have to do instead is make the robot arm so that it goes where you tell it to go, but it also senses and responds to forces the way that a human hand does. So what we've done here is we've modified the way that we control the, the robot so that it can feel forces that are being exerted on it by its environment and it responds to those forces similar to the way a human hand would. So if we reach out to, to grapple a satellite and it's not exactly where we thought it was, what will happen is the robot will hit the satellite, sense the forces, and instead of pushing to where we told it to go, it will stop pushing. When I'm moving this, it, I'm actually, I'm not really moving it. That's right. It's just sensing where I want it to go and responding to me. Exactly. It's moving itself. Wow. That is so cool. We launch billion dollar satellites into orbit 20,000 miles above the surface of our planet. And if they break down or drift away, there is nothing we can do about it. But the experts at NRL are using all their scientific and engineering know-how to create space robots that function almost autonomously. If their efforts are successful, this country will soon have its very own tow truck and repair service in space. In the dangerous arena of combat operations, what you can't see can kill you. In war, the battlefield is a dangerous place. And it becomes even deadlier for what you can't see. On the gun. Roger, got the gun. Coming down. Not seeing the enemy concealed under camouflage or not spotting a deadly gas can get soldiers killed. The Army Research Laboratory is working on improving current technology to give U.S. warfighters supervision. To see how this supervision would work, we need to start with infrared light. Infrared light, or IR, is invisible to the naked eye. Now every object emits IR light, you just can't see it. The hotter an object, the more IR it emits. And what makes IR unique is that it can pass through smoke, fog, and haze. To detect IR light, you need a special camera. Most of them work like this. A special lens focuses the IR light onto a detector inside the camera. The detector material absorbs the light and converts it into electrical impulses. These impulses are then sent to a signal processor that translates them into video 
and then that video appears on a screen. On the battlefield, smoke screens are used to conceal movement. Now, IR light can pass through regular smoke and fog, but there are military-grade devices out there specifically made to block IR light. To counter against these devices, ARL scientists are making current military-grade IR cameras even more powerful, powerful enough to cut through IR-blocking smoke agents. At the heart of each camera is the detector material. The more sensitive the material, the better the IR camera. Current detector materials can only absorb about 5% of IR light. Because of this low absorption rate, more time is needed to register a clear image. At the Army Research Laboratory, Dr. K.K. Choi took a standard detector material and reconfigured its structure. By using angled sidewalls, he was able to increase the detector's efficiency from 5 to 20 percent, allowing more light to be absorbed. But 20 percent wasn't good enough. For the uh, consumers, the commercial product, 20 percent is good enough. That's what, but you, you don't want anybody to be better than you, detect faster than you, further away from you. You want to be the, the best. Ready to start to lose a weapon? Positive. Unsatisfied, Dr. Choi spent countless hours devising a theoretical model to help him accurately predict performance and that model would become the driving force behind the project. In the past 25 years, in the life of this technology, actually nobody can predict what will happen. People just trial and error, based on trial and error basis. You, you see a phenomenon, you want to predict it, you want to explain it. That's the innate nature of a scientist. But with this modeling, now we can design something, you, you can draw a blueprint, you can make the material, you can produce what you exactly want to make. Dr. Choi's theoretical modeling tool was a scientific breakthrough. It allowed him to modify detectors for increased sensitivity with predictable results. Using this modeling tool, he was able to an efficiency of 70%. It was the high point of his career. When I first observed the detector efficiency, that is so uh, many times higher than uh, what I ever seen. I become so emotional that I come into tears because this is really the goal of my 25 years, and it's so useful uh, for for the army. So I think it's really, really uh, a big satisfaction uh, in in my career. NASA Goddard Space Flight Center created a working camera using his predictions, and they were able to confirm a 30% efficiency rating. Now, other industry partners are working on cameras with predicted efficiencies of up to 70%. With time and continued work, ARL will give the U.S. military a range of these supervision devices. Helicopter pilots would be able to fly in zero visibility. Soldiers could spot and avoid poisonous gases from a distance. Ground forces could use it for marking targets, who to shoot who not to shoot and where not to go. And that could prevent the tragic fratricides that occur during the fog of war.